Merry Christmas. Refuge Church, thanks for being here. Um, if you're new, I want you to know right now we are a church that is passionate about the study of the Bible. He's not, or she's not. <laughs> Maybe you're not either, but if you stick around long enough, that's the goal, is to give you a passion for God's Word. And as a church now, we started four years ago, and we've managed to work our way through all four Gospels. That's how we've started every year for the last four years. Luke being the longest of the Gospels is what we did last year, and because it was so long, I had to skip a ton of it. So what we're going to do this year, starting right now, is we're going to begin going back through the Gospel of Luke and hitting all the things that we missed last year. And we'll do that all the way through Easter and maybe even just a little bit past Easter. Again, if you're new to church or maybe not been around that long, in the Bible there are four Gospels, and they each, each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they tell the story of the life and the birth and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, in the Gospel of John, it doesn't really have a Christmas account, so we don't use it a lot at Christmas, but honestly, it has one of the, the best messages proclaiming that Jesus is God, that Jesus is Emmanuel. It starts right there, and the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, just clearly stating that Jesus and God are inseparable, the two are one. But if we go to, not John, but to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we refer to those as the synoptic gospels. Synoptic is just a word that means same. And so uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all generally include a lot of the same stories, a lot of the same parables, and they used a lot of the same sources to gather information to write their gospels. Mark was the very first gospel written. It's the shortest. So if you want a place to start in the gospels and reading, you go to the gospel of Mark. It's short. And most people believe that Mark was the original gospel written and it was a source for both Luke and Matthew. And so they drew a lot of information from the gospel of Mark. So what you find in Mark, you will also find in Matthew and Luke. Matthew, when he wrote his gospel, it starts with that long genealogy, if you remember, and this person beget, this person beget, this person. The reason for that is Matthew is writing to a, a Jewish audience, and that was very important. Heritage and ancestry was important, and so Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. Along comes Luke, where we're going to be for the next four or five months, and, and he's writing not to a Jewish audience, but he's actually, Luke is a non-Jew, and he's writing to another non-Jew. Luke is a doctor. The non-Jew that he's writing to is, is a wealthy person, and so we got two wealthy people, non-Jews, writing this gospel and gathering information. Luke's gospel is a compilation of eyewitness testimony, and so his gospel tends to be very thorough. That's why it's so long, and there's just all these details. In Luke's gospel, we get the most famous telling of the Christmas story. And if you watch the Charlie Brown Christmas special and, you know, Linus comes out and what's Christmas all about and he's holding his little blanket, uh, it's Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. In case you want to go recite that or memorize that, I think all three of our kids have memorized that at some point in time uh, in grade school at their school. Season of Advent. That's what we kind of began last week. We said Advent means the coming. Advent is a time of celebration. It's a time of celebrating Christmas, but it's also a time, we said, of expectant waiting for Christ's glorious return when he returns to earth for the final time as the King of Kings. And I know many of us are maybe longing for that a little more than we have in the past. 2020 has certainly been a year for the history books, no doubt. I mean, I, I started my sermon this week on Tuesday, and I wrote in my notes, 1.5 million people dead from the pandemic. I checked it again this morning. I had to update my notes to 1.6 million people dead from the pandemic. We had this year a lot of small businesses that just shut down. A lot of people lost jobs because of it. And then we had some of the outpourings of that. A lot of kids that graduated high school last year, some of them here at Refuge, they had their graduations canceled. I know that might seem like a minor thing, but, but life has just been disrupted in 2020. And then we had, if you remember, in March and, and May and April in there, we had the racial unrest with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And then most recently, we've had democracy itself question in our country with election results. We had the impeachment of a president at least halfway through there earlier this year. So for our nation, for America, this will be a year, you go down generations and generations, this will be a year that people come back and study as just one of those pivotal years. Whether good or bad, we don't know yet, but a pivotal year in our country. It's right there with 1865, the start of the Civil War, and 1945, and, and Pearl Harbor, and the start of World War II, or even 1968 with the, the changes in, in civil unrest at that time. It's been a, just a big year, a lot of stuff happening. There are people right now 
who couldn't care less. And they couldn't care less because with that pain over here, their personal pain this year or their personal darkness makes all of that stuff that they see on the news every night seem insignificant. I mean, the person this year who lost a child, none of that stuff really matters. Or the wife, I know a couple of them this year who lost husbands. That stuff seems very minuscule right now. Or the husband who lost a wife or kids who lost a dad or the person who got that life-altering news or a life-ending diagnosis or the person right now who is walking through a pit of depression and really just wants this life to end. Or the addict, I have a friend right now sitting in a jail cell wondering, how did it come to this? How did I get here? See, all around us, there are people suffering, personal suffering, people who this time of year start to feel a little bit forgotten. And these are people that you pass by every single day. They might be people sitting next to you right now tonight. So when we come to Christmas and we only want to sing the happy songs and we want to keep Christmas just merry and bright, we cheapen the meaning of Christmas. Because Advent, that expectant waiting, Advent always begins in the dark. So that means in this season of Christmas, it ought to be a time that we Christians, we pause and we look deeply at just what is wrong with our world. That the best laid plans, no matter how good, sometimes just don't work out. That even though Christ has come, we're still living in nighttime in this world. That for many right now, it feels like God is either dead or he's asleep on their lives. And so Advent, I think for all of us, is an opportunity to take inventory of that darkness. And as we look at that darkness, not to see it as hopeless, but to stare in the face of darkness and find hope. Fleming Rutledge, she's an Episcopal priest, she says, To be a Christian is to live every day of our lives in solidarity with those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, but to live in the unshakable hope of those who expect the dawn. Hope is defined as the confident expectation of better days ahead. It's believing that there is a light coming at the end of the tunnel. But how do you give hope to the beggar that's on the street corner? I mean, there's a lot of them right now in town. Every, every corner it seems like I come up to, there is just an, a, a large increase in the number of homeless people standing on the corner. No food, no shelter. How do you give that person hope? Or how do you give hope to the person who by the world's standards, has everything, but is still longing for happiness and never can seem to find it. Well, you can't. But this is church, so we say, of course, but Jesus can. That's why this time of year, we shouldn't get so wrapped up just in the sentimentalism of the season, but we should make this a season about stubborn, infallible hope. Hope in the midst of suffering, hope in the midst of loss, hope for a world that's dead in sin, hope for a world that's without a chance, without a coming of a baby. We're going to jump into Luke's gospel in a minute, but before we get there, I want to go briefly back to the Old Testament. This is the people that were living in a season of Advent for the first coming of Jesus, the Jewish nation, the Israelites. Jeremiah was a prophet, not a bulldog, he was a prophet. Jeremiah 33, verse 12, he says this, Prophets speak on behalf of God. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, in this place that is waste, in this place that is waste without man or beast and in all of its cities, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks. Jeremiah is trying to give his people hope. This is a period of time in Israel's history when it was dark. They'd been divided as a nation in the north and the south. You had Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Israel had already fallen to Assyria. Judah is just barely hanging on. Assyria defeats Babylon. They're this new up-and-coming superpower. Egypt sees this, and they're trying to, trying to take advantage of the situation. There's a superpower in the south, and so they take Judah into their empire, and that's, that's kind of okay for the people of Judah. Babylon's not having any of it, so they're turning their attention on Egypt, and they end up taking Judah for themselves. Judah doesn't like this, so they stage a revolt, but they're defeated because they're small. They try a second time. They fail again miserably. And this time, Babylon comes in, and they come down with complete and utter brutality. They destroy the temple. They destroy the city of Jerusalem. They kill all the livestock, which is where your food and your wealth comes from. 
And so to say for Israel that the season of Advent begins in the dark is an understatement. Loss and suffering is all around them. The people feel like God is asleep, that he has abandoned them. And if you've read Jeremiah or know anything about him, he gets this bad rap as being the crying prophet, and it's always poor me and poor us and poor this. It's a bad rap. He's a prophet right here trying to instill hope in his people. Verse 13, he says, In the cities of the hill country, the cities of Shephelah, in the cities of Negev, in the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem, in the cities of Judah, he says, Flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them. He says, it's not always going to be like this. It's going to be better. And those cities may not mean anything to us, but it'd be like saying, yeah, things are really bad in L.A. right now, but it's going to get better. Chicago and New York City, yeah, it looks really bad right now, but they're going to thrive again. These people would know these cities. He says, verse 14, he says, behold, the days are coming. Look ahead. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, Jerusalem will dwell securely, for thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And so for those of us B.C., for those of us now after Christ in A.D., we know who that righteous branch is. We know that's Jesus. And we know who executes justice. And we know who sits on the throne of David. We know that's Jesus. He's the Messiah. But Israel, they had to wait in darkness after Jeremiah for another 600 years. The Advent is all about waiting, expecting. And so that brings us now up to the Gospel of Luke, where we begin to see that waiting come to conclusion and Jeremiah's prophecy fulfilled. And so Luke, I'll just catch you up to where we're going to be in Luke tonight. He starts his gospel with a little bit of a backstory on John the Baptist. Don't know who that is. John the Baptist is the one who, for the very first time seeing Jesus starting his ministry, said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, giving hope to the people. Then Luke goes on to tell us about the angel Gabriel. You know, he comes to see Mary, and even though Mary's a virgin, she would bear a child, and he would sit on the throne of David, and then Luke gives some historical details about a census that's happening by Caesar Augustus, and then we understand why Mary and Joseph had to travel to Bethlehem, the city of David, and then it happens. Mary gives birth to a son, and she wraps him in swaddling clothes, and she lies him in a manger, so we know that story. And then we hear about the flock and the angel showing up to the shepherds. The flocks have been restored, and the shepherds are in the fields, and the angel shows up, and they say, hark, because that's what angels say. They say, hark. I bring good news for all people, glory to God in the highest and on earth. We know, right? Peace, what? Goodwill towards men. And those shepherds, they go to visit baby Jesus. We think this all happens immediately. And they go to visit Jesus, and they see Jesus, and then they go tell it on the mountains and over the hills and everywhere. I'm trying to include some Christmas songs tonight. And all these stories are familiar. I mean, if you've been in the church, you know them. But even if you're outside the church, generally, I'd say everybody in America knows these stories. And we're familiar with the songs. I mean, the song we just sang, we know that. And we all have the nativity sets with Mary and Joseph, the angels and the shepherds. We even, we even put those wise men in our nativity sets. And those guys, most historians don't think, showed up for two or three years later. But we're like, eh, they're Christmas. Put those wise men in there, too. You know, there's no songs in the Christmas story about this lady that's also in the story we never hear about. It. You know who's never included in a nativity set? Even though we include these wise men, it's this lady named Anna. Y'all know Anna, right? Some of you do. It's, it's right there. It's Luke chapter 2. That's the Christmas chapter. And so if you've ever read the Christmas chapter, you should have met Anna. But over history, Anna's mostly been forgotten. I've never heard in my life a Christmas sermon about her. I even Googled it this week. There's not hardly any out there. Never heard her mentioned in the thousands of songs that Way FM has been playing since July of this year for Christmas. Man, they play some terrible songs on there too. Sorry. I actually Googled this week, Anna Nativity figure. I'm like, I'm going to see. I'm going to get one for Karen for Christmas. We'll put it on our Christmas tree. <laughs> And I found one on Etsy that had been discontinued in 2017. No other figures of Anna. You can't put Anna, if you guys find one, that would be a great Christmas gift for your pastor in the future. But this woman, this Anna, she's included by name in God's word. But history and the church has mostly forgotten and ignored her. 
And so let me give you some backstory to where we're going to come to tonight. Mary and Joseph, they've had the baby Jesus, he, the, the, the angels and everything has showed up and, and they're there and um, they're devout Jews. And so because they are devout Jews, and we've we got to remember Jesus is Jewish, Mary and Joseph are Jewy, Jewish, um, they follow the Levitical purification laws. And so after a child was born, they had to be circumcised eight days later. So they wait and they circumcise Jesus. And after that, then Mary had to purify for 33 days. And I don't remember what it is. I think it's longer if it's a girl and shorter if it's a boy, but she has to purify 33 days, basically keep herself separated from the public before she can go out. And there's other parts of the ritual. Once that time, the circumcision and the purification of Mary ended, once that ended, then as, as righteous Jews, they were to go immediately to the temple. Temples in Jerusalem, I, I looked it up, Bethlehem to Jerusalem is only about six miles, so it would be a pretty easy lot, walk, but we don't know if they were in Bethlehem when they were headed there or, or where, if they were in Nazareth, which would be 66 miles, it would be a much longer walk. They walked into Jerusalem and they were supposed to present a sacrifice to the priest. And that was just what they did after you had a child. And the sacrifice was normally a lamb. And so um, they would come and they would sacrifice the lamb. The priest would do it. But if the woman was poor, which we know that Mary was from all the stories, then instead of offering a lamb, she could offer two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. I'm trying to get in the Christmas song. She could, two turtle doves is really what it is. And um, that's how we know that the Magi hasn't showed up yet because if they had, if the wise man had been in the story now and they'd brought Mary and Joseph gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that stuff was worth a lot of money. They could have sold the gold, bought them a lamb, and went to the temple with a lamb. But they show up with these two turtle doves so we know the wise men haven't showed up. They're still poor. And then as they're at the temple and they do the sacrifice, this guy named Simeon shows up. He's a prophet and he shows up and he just gives a blessing to Jesus. He's older and this is what his whole life has built towards and he gives a blessing to Jesus. He's another forgotten character of the story, but here's a guy who's one of the first that, that declares Jesus as the Messiah and recognizes him as the Messiah. And so verse 34, Simeon says, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. So, Hard words for Mary to hear, but, but he's speaking truth, and we know now where that's to lead. Then in Scripture, Luke chapter 2, we're introduced to our Christmas hero, Anna. So that's where I'm going to begin tonight. Uh, Anna, verse 36, it says, Anna, which is a word that means uh, grace or favor. That's what her name means. Anna, a prophet. Women can be prophets. Women can speak God's word. Anna, a prophet, was there in the temple. What a coincidence. She's there in the temple where Jesus is going to show up. But we know there are no coincidences with God. And so Anna, she's there in the temple. If you're not familiar with what the temple is, at, at the time before Jesus, the temple was a place where God dwelt on earth. If you wanted to speak to God, you went to the temple. That's the only place you could speak to God, and you could only speak to God through the priests and only at certain times. The temple was the place where you went to atone for your sin through sacrifices. The temple was the place where the center of life happened, the place of the center of faith. The temple is where you went to worship. It says she, Anna, was at the temple, and we get some details about her. She's the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and that doesn't mean anything to us sitting here tonight, but essentially what Luke is doing is he's giving Anna's family tree, saying, look, I, I'm not making this stuff up. If you want to verify what I'm telling you, this is a real person with real stories, check my sources. So it says, Anna was the daughter of Phineal, and then he adds this line, which all women love to hear, and she was very old. She was very old. Very old like Sarah, very old like Elizabeth, and if you know who those people are, you know it's better to not discount older women in Scripture. Older women are a part of a long tradition of God using those who you least expect to be channels of His grace. But remember what I said, that Advent always begins in the dark. And so here comes our darkness. Verse 36 it says, Anna's husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. The honeymoon had just barely ended. And you've got this young woman, because, you know, people got married early, 13, 14 years old. You've got this young woman who's probably in her early 20s at best, and she just lost the love of her life. She just lost her companion. Her 
best friend, the person that knew her better than anyone knew her, the person with whom she had goals and dreams, the person who she depended upon financially, and that person is now gone. And from that day forward, she lived as a widow, forgotten by her family, because there's no mention of them here to help her or trying to save her or do anything for her. She's been forgotten by society. Fortunately, there's temple workers around here probably helping provide for her, take care of her. And yet here we are today, and we've still forgotten poor Anna. And I'm sure the, the funeral, there was this outpouring of grief. You know, everybody always comes to the funeral, and there's crowds, and I'll be there for you. Just let me know if you need anything. We're here. You can count on us. And the funeral ends, and everybody goes back to regular life. And this woman remains in a place of waste. It's the parallel between Jeremiah and Luke. And Jeremiah were invited into the suffering of an entire nation. And Luke were invited into the suffering of a single individual. And what we're to see here is that our God, the God of Advent, is big enough to care about the suffering of nations. And so he cares about pandemics, and he cares about racial injustice, and he cares about generational poverty, and all these big picture things that we see on the evening news. But that same God is tender enough to care just as deeply about your personal suffering. The sadness you don't talk about, the guilt and remorse you carry, your insecurities, your physical, your emotional pain, the battle you have to hold on to your faith. And so God is big. And God is tender, and he cares about suffering. That was unique for the pagan culture that Anna lived in. In that culture, there were basically three views on suffering. And I know you guys in the back are having a little issue with the slide. I think if you click on the next one, it should clear that other stuff out. If not, here, hit a clear all. There you go. Are we good? All right, perfect. So there's three views on suffering that are happening in the pagan culture. And it depended kind of where you were in society. If, if you were pagan, but you were kind of spiritual, you know, we, people that are spiritual. If you were spiritual, suffering was deserved. It was, it was a karma mentality. If you suffered, it's because you did something to earn that suffering. And so if you were poor and impoverished, well, what did your family do to be poor? If you were oppressed by society, well, what does your people group cause to cause that oppression? If your husband had died like Anna, and you had no son to take care of you, gee, Anna, what kind of life are you live? Suffering was earned, and if you suffered, you deserved it. That's what they thought. Are there people today that still think that way? You, you bet. Karen, when she, she first, the very first time she got depression and didn't know what it was and didn't know what to do to fix it and solve it, she went to see a Christian counselor, and that counselor kept trying to uncover the sins that were causing her depression. Instead of recognizing that it's a chemical imbalance, it's a medical issue. Yes, therapy can help, but she did nothing to deserve or earn depression. And so the solution for people in this camp, the solution, if suffering is deserved, then the solution is if you suffer, you just got to endure it. There is no solution. You earned it. Now pay the price. There are other people in society in the pagan culture, they were ir irreligious. They, they were the worldly, secular people. And they simply thought, suffering's random. I mean, it's just, it's just random. The whole world is, is this random thing. And so there's no purpose to suffering. It's just a fact of life. Don't look for meaning in your suffering. It's arbitrary. And so the people in this camp, the solution was, well, then spend every minute of your life trying to avoid suffering. Are there those of us who do that today? Absolutely. And if we're honest, I think in the room tonight, at some level, we all fall into this camp. We build and we structure our lives to mostly avoid suffering and pain. You got a third group of people. These were the educated people. They um, probably wore berets and little tweed jackets, and they were the Stoics of the time. And they said that suffering was an illusion. If you're suffering, if, if you're feeling suffering, that's just a figment of your imagination. It's your thoughts lying to you. And if you believe those thoughts, that's what causes the suffering. And so their solution to suffering is if you could overcome your thoughts, you could transcend suffering. I tried that this week. I was cooking Thanksgiving do-over dinner for the family. They were at a soccer game. I was going to have this beautiful meal ready when they got home. And I think I got the stuffing out of the oven. And I set it on the counter, but I forgot I had just got it out of the oven. So I grabbed it to pick it up and put it back in. And, of course, it was scorching hot. 
it burnt my hands really bad. And so uh, I tried this technique. I'm like, this pain is not real. <laughs> this pain is a figment of my imagination. And man, whoever has that thought or came up with that idea, they sit on a throne of lies to tie in another Christmas reference. So those are the three views in that culture. But then along comes this baby named Jesus. He's the God of the universe in human form. And he's perfect and he's holy. And so God didn't do anything to earn his suffering. He didn't do anything to deserve suffering. And yet God enters into human history willfully to endure suffering. Jesus comes and he lives a perfect life. All his karma should be good karma. But he suffers and dies on a cross. He didn't earn or deserve that. And Jesus comes and we see in his suffering that it isn't random, that there is a plan to his suffering. Even if that plan isn't known or understood, there is a plan and purpose to suffering. And when Jesus suffers and he's there on the cross, he doesn't try to meditate his way out of the suffering. He doesn't try to transcend that suffering. He faces the suffering head on. He battles the suffering and he tries to defeat, and he does defeat the suffering like an enemy. Jesus changed everything with suffering. And this is why the early church treated those who suffered so much differently than the rest of the culture around them. When somebody was suffering, there was no judgment for their suffering. There was no condemnation. There was only compassion. And so they would come near to those suffering, and they would sit with them in their darkness. And in that darkness, they would begin to offer hope. They would say, you don't deserve to suffer. You didn't earn the suffering. God doesn't want you to suffer, but there is purpose in the suffering that you have. Even if you don't see it right now, even if you don't feel it, Jesus is here with you in this suffering. Or as Paul says in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors of our suffering through him who loves us. There's a poet in the 1800s, you may have heard the name, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Uh, he married a lady named Fanny. They went on to have five kids, apparently gluttons for punishment, but they had five kids. In July of 1861, Fanny was trimming the hair of her seven-year-old daughter's hair, and she decided to do really pretty curls, and she wanted to preserve those curls, and so then you preserved them in this sealing wax, and she's, you know, got a candle, and she's doing this wax thing, and a gust of wind comes through an open window. The hot wax blew onto her dress, and it caught her dress on fire, and screaming, she runs into her husband Henry's study, and there the two of them attempted to put out the flames, but they began to engulf her. Through this, Henry suffered severe burns on his arms and face. But his wife, Fanny, died the next morning. And because of his own injuries in this whole trauma, he wasn't even able to attend her funeral. And so after this, he fell into this deep clinical depression. It's what we know it as today. It wasn't called that then. It was a deep clinical depression. And so that Christmas, the years 1861, the poet who uses words for a living, a poet, the only words he could write was, how inexpressibly sad are the holidays. By the next Christmas, a year had passed. I think if you hit clear all, there, that should clear that out there. If you can, if you find a clear all. If not, we'll just have the little nativity scenes on the, the thing the rest of the night. Uh, by 1862, next Christmas comes, he's still living in that pit of darkness. And he still can only muster up the words, a Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. Two years have gone by. He's still in depression. By the next year, the fall of 1863, his son, one of his kids, had enlisted in the Union Army against his wishes. Civil War is beginning, and his son gets shot in battle. He nearly dies, but he does survive. They say that the, the bullet missed, I guess, a spinal cord by an inch, and if he had been hit by that, he would have either died or been paralyzed for life. Either way, fall of 1863, his son is shot, and it's a long, brutal, difficult recovery for the next several years, and so just more trauma in his life. And so that Christmas, three Christmases later, Longfellow, he's a 57-year-old widower, he's a father of six children, the oldest who had just been shot and nearly paralyzed. His country that he loved was fighting a war against itself, against slavery, that's just the worst injustice ever. And so he's, he has this dissonance in his heart. 
And he decides to pen those words in this beautiful poem. Perhaps you've heard it before. It says, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how as that day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. He says, till ringing, Singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth, those cannons thundered in the south, and with the sound of the carols drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And he says this, and in despair, I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth. I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And then he ends it this way, then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. See, that poem vacillates between despair and hope. You can feel the tension between the two. A nation suffering, his personal suffering, but he ends with God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. That's not optimism, that's hope. That's stubborn hope. Optimism is a belief that your future will be better because of the circumstances you see in the present. You're able to see the good in your present circumstances so you can see that your future will turn out better. It's the glass half full thing. Christians are not optimists, that's not what we are. Because we can see the sin and the darkness and the suffering and the death all around us better than anyone else can. Optimism is naive. No matter how optimistic you are, suffering is still going to happen in your life. No matter how optimistic you are, you're still going to die, and there's nothing that you can do about that. But hope is different. It's not optimism. It's not wishful thinking. It's an expectation that someone from outside of our hopeless mess will step in and intervene. The word for hope in Hebrew is tikvah. It's also the same word used in the Old Testament for rope. And its root word comes from a word that means bind up or to wait for. And so hope is the rope that we cling to when there's just nothing else that we can grab onto. Hope is where we wait until someone else comes in and intervenes in our suffering. And so back to our forgotten hero of Christmas, back to Anna. Hope is what has carried her through life for 60 years, living as a widow, impoverished, in a temple, really waiting for death. It says, Anna never left the temple. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. I don't know if she really never left the temple. That'd be a long time to stay at a temple. I think this is hyperbole. But basically all Luke is saying is, man, Anna was there a lot. It'd be like saying, you know, Robert Iwanek, he never leaves SFCA. That guy is there all the time, and he is. I see him there. Really, I think he sleep there or something. But he's there a lot, and that's what Anna was. She was there at the temple. She never left, and she's there, and she's worshiping, and she's praying. And remember what the temple is? The temple is the place where God, well, the place where God could be met. Anna was able to cling to the rope of hope because she stayed close to God. That's what gave her hope. That's what carried her through, staying close to God. I'll share a story. My grandma, Ruth, my dad's mom, There's a reason why the story hit home really close for me this week is um, I was really close to her. Um, My dad is the youngest of 10 kids, a big family. So he's the baby of of 10 kids, and they treat him like the baby of the family too. And his dad was a Pentecostal pastor, preacher, church planner. And so my dad's dad moved their family from Iowa to Nebraska to a church. He got fired from that church, I understand, and then they moved um, to Indiana there's a family that started this little church and they brought him in to be the pastor and to build and grow this little church. And my parents were eventually married in that church. And so my dad's family, needless to say, was poor. They lived on a small farm in Indiana. And it's weird because my grandma was educated in in the early 1900s. She had a college degree. She had become a teacher, but she gave all of that up to raise these 10 kids and to be a part of the ministry with her husband. And so at age 46, I'm 45. At age 46, she gave birth to my dad, if you can imagine that. Ten kids gave birth to my dad at 46. That same day, she gave birth to my dad. Her oldest daughter also gave birth to a son. So my dad has a cousin that's the exact same age as he is. But her daughter, my dad's oldest sister, died in childbirth. 
And so just imagine that day, the joy of a new child coming into the family, but the grief of not losing a child, which is really no grief worse than that in this world. And then five years later, her husband passed away of a massive heart attack. So my grandma lived the next 40 plus years of her life as a widow who had lost a child, who had lost the financial support of her husband, very humble circumstances. And so I asked my dad, I'm like, how did you guys survive? And he's like, we had chickens and cows and, you know, the church would pitch in and give us money and help out when we needed it. And the older siblings, when they went out and got jobs, would send money. And she eventually got social security not long after he was born, apparently, and, and was able to have some support. And I remember going to their house as a kid and they got the government cheese and all of that, which is delicious, by the way. And um, we would go over, they had a, I don't know if this is a country thing or what, but a, a pitcher, like a, a basin with water with a ladle and all of us cousins one of our traditions is every Sunday there's like 50 of us cousins or whatever we'd go over and hang out at grandma's house we all drank the water with the ladle out of the uh, bucket there that's how we got water to drink obviously no COVID back then when we were doing that my grandma had a hard life lost a daughter lost her son or lost her husband at an early age eventually another son passed away of a heart attack that's why I need to be mindful and take my blood pressure meds and all of that stuff but my grandma, if you ever met her, was truly, and I mean this, she was truly the most joyful person you could ever meet. And she was joyful, and I promise you this, and I wasn't a Christian at the time, so this is all very outside to me. She was joyful because she stayed close and connected to God. I remember as a kid, the mailbox was about a half mile from her house to go get the mail every day. And she would go get the mail, and the entire way there and the entire way back, she would talk to God. She would just pray out loud and talk to God like a running conversation all the way to the mailbox, all the way back. She had a washing machine in the house, and it was old. I don't know if you've ever seen these old washing machines, but uh, we called them washing machines. And we would do the laundry, and you like had to put each piece of clothes through these spinners, and you cranked them through, and it strained them out. I don't even remember how it all worked. But as she would do the laundry, and she would hang them on the clothesline outside, because that's how you dry them, she would just sing hymns. The whole time she would do that, she would just sing hymns. And my grandma was an amazing pianist. I mean, really good. She's four foot 11, full of joy and energy. And she would every day sit down at the piano and just start playing songs. And she would sing words. I didn't know what the words were, but just joy and energy bouncing up and down. You know what else she didn't do? She never, ever missed church. She was there with the family of God. And so she was there Sunday morning and she was there Sunday night and she was there on Wednesday and probably other nights of the week with her church family. And so through all of her pain and through all of her suffering, she clung to hope because she stayed connected to God. The hope that God was working, the hope that one day God would turn her sorrow into joy. She clung to that because she clung to God. Verse 38 says, Anna came up to them. She came up to Mary Joseph and the baby Jesus. And at that very moment, she gave thanks to God. She just comes up to him, sees Jesus, and she knew. She knew who he was. She knew that Jesus was God because she had drawn so close to God for the last 60 plus years. She spent 60 years getting to know God and she sees Jesus in the flesh and she knew that was the Messiah. It says she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So after this, she goes out and she tells everybody. She's old, but she's bold. So she tells the temple workers, and she tells the priests, and she tells the Pharisees, anyone who would listen, she tells them about the hope that had come to her people. As I said in the beginning, tonight you could be sitting next to an Anna, someone who is suffering, someone who is barely clinging on to hope, or maybe this past week, how many of those Henrys have you come across? Somebody that is just fighting that battle between despair and hope every day. Now I get for Christmas, for many of us, it is a festive time and a joyous time. But for just as many people, it's a very difficult time. It's difficult for those who feel forgotten. It's difficult for those who have to put a smile on their face at the Christmas party and come home every night to tears. And so can I challenge you this week? Would you be willing to sit in the dark with someone who is suffering in this season? And I'm saying go to them and preach a sermon. I'm saying just sit with them and be present and meet them in their suffering like Jesus meets you in your suffering. And if you're here tonight or if you're listening online at some point, 
and you are suffering through this season. When Christ died, the Spirit of God left the temple, so we don't have to go to a temple to connect and to be near God. The Spirit of God entered believers' hearts. And so he's here right now. He's there every day, and so you can walk to the mailbox, and you can talk to Jesus. And you can be honest with him and tell him whatever you want to tell him and what you're feeling and your despair versus your hope. And you can go to his word and you can read it and you can hear him speak back to you. You can be with his people as often as you'd like. You can come here and you can worship him and you can learn about him and you can just draw close to him. Philip Yancey, he writes, from God's viewpoint and Satan's, Christmas signals far more than the birth of a baby. It was an invasion the decisive advance in the great struggle of the cosmos. Hope was born in a manger. We finally got that light at the end of the tunnel. But on the cross, hate was strong. It marked the Son of God. And in despair, he bowed his head and he died. But the poem doesn't end there. On the third day, hope loudly proclaimed, God is not dead nor doth he sleep. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here in your name tonight. God, we thank you for your word that just carries so much truth. God, I pray tonight for anybody who is listening, they're here or online, that if they are suffering, that we would put people in their lives to help draw them close to you, that they would draw close through prayer, through your word, and God, I just ask, we came through this series of being awake, and so we just ask you, keep us awake in this Christmas season for 2020 to be aware of the darkness and the suffering that is around us, that we don't walk past people and just assume everything's okay, that we notice people, and we notice the little things they do that just shows us that maybe, maybe something's not right, maybe they're suffering and despair, and their life feels like a waste, just Reveal those people to us, God, so we can sit with them, we can be with them, we can draw them to your hope. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a deep breath Don't know what to say when I look in your eyes You made the world before I was born Here I am holding you in my arms tonight Noel, Noel Jesus, sorry man so near I'm staring into the face of my Savior King and Creator could have left us on our own but you're here you're here don't know how long I'm gonna have you I'll be watching when you change the world and Look at your hands, they're still so small Someday you're gonna stretch them out and save us all
Someday I'm gonna look back on this The night that God became a baby boy Someday you're gonna go home again But you leave your spirit and flood the world with joy You'll be here I'm holding you so
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. things and more. God, we just praise you for the hope that we have in Jesus. God, would you do love and hope just cover all of us? for being here this evening. I want to also thank everybody who brought in a gift for the angel tree tonight and, and appreciate you partnering with us in that and so that we can take some gifts into the Pine Manor neighborhood and bless some families over there. And those of you who are doing the food, I want to thank you for that as well. And we bless them with food and meals and, and they don't have to be hungry this holiday season. Not only that, they get some really nice and good stuff to eat as well. And so just thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for being here tonight. Next week is our annual Christmas gathering. And I'll tell you, it's going to look a little bit different this year, but I think it's going to be different in a good way. Um, we're bringing in people that aren't able to join us here in person to be a part of it. And so they're recording videos and different things that are going to be a part of the service. Lots of different songs, lots of different musicians, lots of different speakers and scripture readings. The kids are going to do a little nativity set. I'm going to push on them to put Anna in it somewhere uh, and have a little bit of Anna or Grace in that. At least there'll be Grace in it, even if that's not Anna, and that's what her name means. And so just be here next week. Uh, bring a friend or bring a guest if you'd like. We're going to try to add some chairs, but still keep them spaced out and all that. I will ask you, um, just if you can, wear a mask next week so we can be considerate to those who might be coming in or visiting us for the first time and, and make them feel safe and secure as they're here. As you go out this week, man, I will tell you, that a lot of people you're coming past are going through some junk. And so just be awake, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, say in prayer to God and say, hey, is this somebody you want me to sit with in the darkness? God bless, love you all, see you next week.